Jesus said all sin can be forgiven except one. The penalty for this sin is the second death in the lake of fire. Many have worried they or someone they know may be in danger of this unforgivable sin. Some say it could be grievous sins like murder abuse or rejection of God's grace. Others fear more common failures like divorce, suicide, or repeated unrepentant behavior may condemn them. Many simply feel overwhelmed by guilt, believing their lifetime of wrongdoing too great to be pardoned. But even these grievous sins can be forgiven if the person has a change of heart and genuinely seeks forgiveness. In the Bible, Paul fiercely persecuted Christians, yet later repented and received God's mercy. King David committed terrible sins, but repented in tears and was forgiven. Moses doubted God, but turned back to him. Peter denied knowing Jesus, but then wept in remorse and was reconciled. The fact is that we are all sinners and need the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. As Romans 3.23 declares, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, no one is perfect. We all stumble at some point, but God knows our weakness and is patient with us. If we ever feel distant from God because of repeated sins, do not despair. Satan wants us to believe we have crossed the line, but that is a lie. As long as we have breath, it is not too late to sincerely return to God. Like the prodigal son, we will be welcomed with open arms by our heavenly Father. God understands this and will not judge anyone unjustly. As Ezekiel 33, 11 says, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Even those who have committed the worst sins can receive forgiveness if they turn to God. So how can a person know if they've committed this one unforgivable sin? And is there hope for those who think they have? Let's see what the Bible says about this unpardonable sin. Jesus told the Jewish leaders of his day, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. But what does it mean to blaspheme the Spirit? Does this mean that if a person has ever said anything against the Holy Spirit, they're doomed to the lake of fire? No, this is not what he meant. In fact, they had just accused him of performing miracles by the Spirit of Satan. Yet he didn't tell them they had blasphemed the Spirit. Rather, he was warning them they were in danger of it. So what did he mean? To blaspheme the Spirit. When the Jewish leaders made these claims, they knew it wasn't true. They watched him heal people, cast out demons, and do other miracles. They knew the scriptures intimately, and they knew the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah were happening right in front of their eyes. One of the Pharisees even told him, we know you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And yet in an effort to dissuade his followers and elevate their own status, they claimed what he did was not of God, but of Satan. It was not done unknowingly. Rather, it was with the full knowledge of what they were doing. This unpardonable sin cannot be committed in ignorance or weakness. It can't be committed by a person who genuinely believes there is no God or even questions if God exists. Rather, like the Jewish leaders who understood the scripture and had the Messiah standing in front of them, this sin can only be committed by those who have an intimate knowledge of God, His Word, His way of life, and the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. This unforgivable or unpardonable sin can only be committed with a full knowledge and understanding of what one is doing. It cannot be committed in ignorance, deception, or weakness. And it actually has to do with one's attitude. Hebrews 10, 26 says, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Hebrews 6 says, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened to have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God to renew them again to repentance. So a person must first have had a clear understanding of the truth of Scripture and God's way of life. Then they must intentionally, purposefully, and willfully reject God in His ways. The difference between sinning willfully and sinning willingly is that willful sin is the fully deliberate act and attitude to never repent of sin. Someone who sins willfully is not blinded, like most of the world is now. They have a knowledge of the truth. They know the effect of Christ's sacrifice and they profane it. He or she has a conscience seared to do evil, 
On the other hand, everyone sins willingly when we sin willingly. We're very aware of what we're doing and we're in control, but it's done in weakness, ignorant deception, or by habit. Even Christians who have repented of their previous way of life and accepted Jesus' as sacrifice still fall short and sin willingly, yet in weakness and against their better judgment. Paul described this dilemma in Romans 7:19. For the good that I will to do, I do not do but the evil I will not to do that I practice. It is the sin that Christ died for so that once a person repents and asks forgiveness, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. The sin that can't be forgiven is the intentional, willful sin of deciding to never repent again after having received a knowledge of the truth and had God's spirit work in one's life. This kind of sinner will never even entertain the thought of repenting or desiring to return to God's way of life and they do it while understanding the consequences of being burned up in the lake of fire. As Hebrews 10.26 points out, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, because he or she has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace. It is this conscious, willful act of determining to never repent of sin and accept the blood of Christ that insults and blasphemes the Holy Spirit. So unless a person is in purposeful defiance of the God they have proven exists, they have not insulted or blasphemed the Spirit and therefore have not committed the unpardonable sin. But even if you or someone you know thinks they have committed this sin, it's not too late. God is profoundly merciful. And if you are committed to changing your life, truly sorry for your sins and truly repentant, then you will be forgiven. You can be reconciled and brought near by the blood of Christ. Most of the world, both now and throughout history, have not repented and won't repent in this life. Yet they have not done it willfully. They've been deceived. They have been blinded by Satan and his lies that dominate this world. Most of the humanity is blinded by Satan and his lies. They have not fully understood or had the chance to receive the truth of the gospel. God understands this and will not judge them unjustly. The time will come when all will have the opportunity to know God and choose repentance. Until then, let us pray with compassion for those lost in the darkness of sin and ignorance so that they may receive mercy. Let us not condemn them, but show them the love of Christ through our actions. It is by our example and gentleness that we can lead them to repentance, not by judgment. As for those who already know the truth and the gospel, let us remember that even Christians stumble in sin at times. Let us not think we are better than others. We all need the grace and mercy of God. Let us pray for one another and gently correct each other when needed. Let us also remember that our spiritual walk is a process. We will not become perfect overnight. But if we patiently persevere in faith, prayer, Bible study, and Christian fellowship, we will grow. Our weaknesses can become strengths when we surrender them to God. Let us cultivate our relationship with Christ daily. Pray for more of His Holy Spirit to help us overcome sin. Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. As Hebrews 12, 2 says, and walk in the love of God by pouring out that love on others. In conclusion, let us not fear the unpardonable sin, but rather fear neglecting the great salvation God offers us. His grace is more than enough to forgive us and transform us into the image of Christ. May we respond to this infinite love by loving God with all our heart, soul, and mind, and by loving our neighbor as ourselves. Then our joy will be complete as we glorify God through a life full of kindness, righteousness, and truth. Amen.